Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, to uh, the presenters, I just remind you that uh, this is being recorded. Uh, so uh, there will be more people watching this later. Um, so uh, as Claudia mentioned, you are in the safety, resilience and security track in room three today. Uh, let me introduce uh, the first of the speakers for this track. Uh, Dr. Tejas Veronik is a research engineer at Georgia Institute of Technology. His research interests include data-driven techniques for improvement of air transportation safety, efficiency, and sustainability. He received his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Indian Institute of Technology and a master's and PhD in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. They're just looking forward to your uh, presentation today. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Natesh. Uh, let me share my uh, slideshow. All right. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us in, in the first session, the first presentation of the session today. Um, as Natesh said, my name is Tejas Puranik, and I'm a research engineer at Georgia Tech. Um, today, I will be presenting some of the work that our team has been conducting um, in collaboration with the FAA on fusion and analysis of data sources for assessing aircraft braking performance on non-dry runways. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of our team. Um, the co-authors are listed um, at the bottom of the slide there. Um, and I'm um, honored to be here at the ATM seminar to present our work. All right. So um, just a little bit of uh, uh, outline of uh, the talk that I will be um, going through today. Um, first, I'll start with uh, the background of the work, including some of the motivation and context of um, what we are trying to do and what we are trying to achieve through this work. Uh, following that, I will lay out the specific research objectives of this, uh, uh, of the part of the work that we will be presenting today. Um, keeping in mind that this is part of a broader project that has um, other elements associated with it. Um, following that, I'll go a little bit into some of the data sources that we have used in this work um, and the processing and pre-processing pipelines that we built for using that data in, um, in our uh, research. Um, I will then go into some of the analysis uh, that we conducted and the results that we got from our uh, work and follow that up with some conclusions and next steps, including uh, some future work that we have um, lined up. So um, starting off first with, uh, with the background of the work, um, runway overruns are among the you know, uh, very important um, accident categories as they account for approximately uh, 10 accidents or incidents every year with a varying degree of severity um, according to um, statistics from the FAA. Um, there have been various conditions identified associated with um, <clears throat> the causal factors behind runway overruns, some of them being um, the dynamics of a tailwind approach or wet or contaminated runways that can lead to substantially uh, reduced landing field lengths. Um, the, the current models that we have are based on uh, testing and data collected from systems which might not look, um, uh, be the standard anymore, such as the early generation anti-skid systems. And so there is a, there is a need to um, uh, uh, conduct a detailed analysis of, uh, of this problem to try and understand um, uh, the probable causes and mitigation strategies that can be used on, especially on wet and contaminated runways um, for improving uh, the safety of operations. Um, one, of the, one of the recent, um, I guess, uh, accidents that, that really led to some uh, um, uh, discussion and um, action related to runway overruns was um, from December 2005 at Chicago's Midway Airport, um, where um, after landing on a contaminated runway, um, the aircraft exited off the end of the runway and went on to um, uh, through the fence and resulted in a fatality. Uh, the picture is shown here. And so this, this really led to the, the formation uh, of the Takeoff and Landing Performance Assessment or TALPA Aviation Rulemaking Committee, ARC, 
uh, that produce significant changes to the way uh, aircraft braking is evaluated as well as operationally addressed. The, the ARC consisted of um, stakeholders, um, including airplane manufacturers, um, operators, regulatory authorities, um, and so on. Um, since the uh, findings of the TALPA ARC were submitted to the FAA, um, there, have, uh, there has been uh, subsequent data collected over many years. Um, and uh, this data is thus available for uh, some level of analysis to, um, to look into the uh, recommendations and substantiate some of those recommendations uh, using a data-driven approach. So conduct a, a more, more statistical analysis um, and um, substantiate some of those um, uh, recommendations. So there is really a, a large opportunity here to leverage um, volume, large volumes of uh, routinely collected data to enhance the understanding of aircraft performance on, on dry and non-dry runways in order to further improve safety. Um, and so uh, the, uh, in terms of the overall work that we have undertaken here at uh, Georgia Tech with our um, team, uh, it really consists of two main parts. Um, the first part is related to analysis of data from field condition reports and associated data sets, which is going to be the focus of my talk today. Uh, and we also have ongoing work related to analyzing data collected from flight data recorders, uh, so from routine airline operations, um, and merging those data sources with the field condition reports to pro provide a more enhanced understanding of uh, braking performance. Uh, but the focus of today's talk is going to be on the uh, FICON data analysis, uh, which is what I will be talking about um, in the next few slides. So um, the overarching objective is uh, to quantitatively explore how various different factors can cause or prevent poor braking performance. Um, and we are, we are trying to do this by using various different sources of data and fusing them together. And then finally, comparing these with the, the reported braking action by the pilots through pilot reports. So we, we want to um, look at all these factors in conjunction and uh, compare that against the reported braking action uh, to, see, um, uh, to see whether they match, whether there's um, some level of discrepancy and then um, propose uh, next steps. So before I go into the details of the work, I wanted to um, touch upon the different sources of data that we have used in this work, um, including weather data from the automated surface observing system, field condition reports, runway and airport characteristics, and then the, the process that we use to fuse all of these data uh, sources uh, together in order, to, um, in order to enable the analysis that we've conducted in the work here. So before diving into um, details about the individual data sources, I just wanted to recap some of the uh, recommended standardizations by uh, the TALPA rulemaking committee. So these standardizations uh, you, you know, will, will come in handy when we are looking at um, using the data that was collected based on these uh, standardizations. Um, and so uh, these are mainly related to methods for assessing runway conditions. So this relates to the type, depth, and coverage of contaminants, um, reporting of the braking action by pilots in, in a standard format, um, reporting of other conditions through systems like the NOTAM, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, aircraft performance data, so the landing field length plus the margin, um, crew procedures, including the assessments before landing, and then finally, some of the terminology that's used in runway condition reports and performance data, specifically the runway condition codes and the runway condition um, assessment matrix. So I'll be going into, uh, uh, into detail about some of these uh, standardizations as they pertain to the work that we have conducted here. Uh, but I wanted to sort of show all of the recommended standardizations uh, that go beyond um, uh, some of the analysis that we will show uh, in our work today. So to start off, um, the first source of data that we used um, is called the Automated Surface Observing System or ASOS. Um, these are um, automated sensor suites that are designed for um, meteorological and aviation observing needs. They, uh, they, there are more than 900 ASOS sites in the United States right now. 
um, any of them or most of them located in and around airports. Um, and, and the data collected from these is uh, can be at varying frequencies. Um, however, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, maintains a, an archive uh, that contains one minute interval data from ASOS sites in the United States. So this one minute interval data is, is something that we, um, we wanted to leverage. Um, and so in this work, we, we have developed some scripts to extract that raw data from NOAA um, uh, and process it to make it suitable for um, some of the data analytics work that we're doing here. Uh, the data is not without, its, um, without issues that we usually see in any source of data. So some of the uh, examples are what I have um, outlined on the right side of the slide here, where we could have um, certain portions of mi data missing due to possible power outages or some other reasons. Um, and in these cases, we, we have to um, come up with strategies for uh, data imputation or um, filling the data with um, appropriate values. And then there could be um, erroneous or outlier data, uh, which could be due to sensor malfunctions or other types of errors. Um, and so uh, our data processing or pre-processing has to make sure that we remove these kind of obvious um, outliers uh, so as not to um, bias any of our observations. The second source, and I guess the, the central piece of the, the data sources that we are looking at in this work is the, it's called the field condition report or the FICON. Um, the FICON is a specialized field report that may be included in um, FAA issued notices to airmen or NOTAMs. Uh, these FICONs um, contain a report on the condition and breaking action for a runway. Um, it also contains the description of the runway, uh, precipitation type and depth. So this is uh, information that, that goes into the FICON. Uh, it also contains what are called the runway condition codes. So this is a number between one and six, um, with six being dry and ideal breaking conditions. Um, and, and the condition code is um, derived from the runway condition assessment matrix, which I'll be showing uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, and this is um, based on the RCAM guidance using runway con contaminant type and depth observed at limited number of sampling points on the airport, airport property. Um, so one of the more significant TALPA recommendations was uh, the introduction of a consistent method for assessing these runway conditions, which is known as the runway condition assessment matrix, as I alluded to earlier, or RCAM. Um, I've shown a, a screenshot of uh, the RCAM from the FAA source here uh, on the right. Um, and I just wanted to uh, sort of highlight some of the parts of this that are um, important or relevant in the analysis that we conducted. So the code here uh, in this column, central column, is the runway condition code that I talked about. Um, it goes from zero, which is uh, the worst possible breaking action, um, uh, all the way up to six. Uh, six is usually not reported um, because it's dry uh, and ideal breaking conditions. And then uh, the description contains um, the, the contaminant type and depth that would result in this uh, code being assigned. Now, there, there are various downgrade assessment criteria that, that can be used to downgrade the, uh, the reported condition code based on other um, observations. And uh, from the perspective of the work in this uh, paper, the most important one is, is going to be uh, that we will be looking at is the pilot reported breaking action or PIREP. Um, and um, the, these typically correspond to um, a specific runway condition code. They go from um, good um, to medium to, to nil, which is you know, no breaking action at all as reported by the pilots. So there is expected to be a, a good uh, correlation between the, the code that is put out by the airports and the, the reported breaking action that is observed by the pilots. Uh, it should be noted that uh, PICON reporting is only required for when the runway conditions are other than clean and dry. And the pilot, pilot reports or PIREPs are typically re reported during deteriorating conditions such as uh, snow accumulation or increasing rain rates. So th those are some things to keep in mind when we look at this type of data. 
and uh, a, a, an overview of how this data structure looks like in a table format is shown here. Um, obviously, this is a very, very small subset of the entire data that we, we were looking at. Uh, but there's some uh, some things that I wanted to uh, sort of point out um, in, in this uh, table here. So the pilot reported breaking action, as I said, uh, does not necessarily have to be reported for all, um, all the PyCon reports that we have. Um, the PyCon uh, are typically reported as three numbers, three runway condition codes. And these three stand for one third of the runway surface. So um, uh, if we break them down into uh, runway condition code one, two, and three. These correspond to uh, one third of the runway surface each. There's also a description of the weather that can be extracted um, from the, the PyCon report um, itself. And um, this description coupled with the uh, historical aspect um, of the weather integrated through the ASOS data give us a more complete picture of, um, of the weather. Um, the other thing is uh, the last column here, which, which indicates the status of the PyCon. Uh, since this is all historical data, um, either the PyCon uh, expired after a certain default expiration period, or it was canceled by designated observers who, who have the ability to amend the PyCon prior to this default expiration period. And so in the, in the data that we will be looking at, around 85% of the PyCons were canceled and uh, the remaining 15% expired after the default um, period. Um, the final source of data uh, is related to uh, runway and airport data that we accessed from the FAA um, uh, website uh, shown here. This contains a repository that covers all FAR 139 certified airports in the US. Um, we selected this source due to its high reliability and expansive coverage. Uh, the data from this source comes in the form of four uh, Excel or CSV files. Um, the, the two files that are used within the context of this research include the airport facilities file and the airport runways file, which are uh, merged together to, um, to be used in this research. Um, this database um, provides information such as runway length, elevation, uh, slope, uh, which can be derived from the information in the um, in the data source, as well as other things such as published threshold crossing heights and so on. So this, uh, this static runway information and airport information can then get used with um, the other information that is available. So all of this data then gets fed into our uh, data fusion process or pipeline, um, as I had mentioned uh, a little earlier. So um, I, I'll sort of walk through um, the, the diagram I have on the on the left here, where we have um, an input to our scripts, which go in and extract, given an airport ID, start and end date, um, go in and extract ASOS data through the repository and pre-process it to have a one, one minute interval ASOS database prepared. Uh, on the other side of the, uh, uh, processing is the runway related information. So we have the original PyCon data, which is the table structure that I had shown earlier. And then the FAA's um, airport and runway data, which is static data that can be fused with the PyCon data um, using certain metadata keys, which leads us to the enhanced, uh, what we are calling the enhanced PyCon data. Um, it, it contains <clears throat> all of the information from the original PyCon plus uh, those static variables. And if required, this can then be expanded to uh, the one minute interval to, to make sure that we can match it with the weather data um, and, and get an output of um, the fused uh, data sources together. The overall process output um, is, is kind of shown here schematically. You would have a, Pi, like, uh, a unique PyCon record and we have around 683,000 rows um, with these unique records and then various columns from the different um, sources of data. This data is then used in our analysis framework um, and the results of which I will be uh, going into um, in the next section. So uh, the main purpose, we've, we've divided the analysis into two main parts. Uh, first, we wanted to just look at um, you know, overall statistics and distribution of the data to understand um, you know, 
first of all, where the data is collected and where it comes from. And then also uh, to see, you know, high level trends, including those like, um, you know, geographic and seasonal variation of PyCon reports. Uh, and then the second um, analysis was uh, where we divided the data into subsets of interest and we um, conducted some statistical analysis to, to either substantiate or um, uh, look into whether there were any discrepancies with the recommendations and the claims from uh, the prior process conducted by TALPA. So the overall aim of the analysis is to obtain some insights on how, how selected factors might affect the braking performance at the different airport and runway conditions. So looking at the uh, overall data statistics, as I, um, as I had mentioned earlier, we had around 683,000 um, total rows or total records with around 25 relevant columns. Um, now, because of the because of the way the data is collected, and because of the requirements on um, condition reporting being different for the different um, uh, variables, um, you will see that there's three different subsets that we've broken this down into. So the first one is the one that contains um, runway condition codes, which were the three numbers that I had talked about earlier, um, going from one to six, um, and around 83 percent of the total data set contains uh, runway condition codes. So this is a minimum requirement for our work. We, um, the analysis that we are trying to conduct cannot be conducted without uh, the FICON records that have runway condition codes. So this is our first subset. The second one is the subset that contains pilot reported breaking action or PIREPS. Uh, this is around 1.74%. So as um, you can see, there's a precipitous drop in the amount of flight records or the amount of um, PyCons that come with a pilot reported breaking action. And this is anticipated, as I said, because these are typically, um, there is a lower requirement for uh, reporting these than the um, runway condition codes. And then uh, looking at the intersection of both of these, um, we have a subset around 9,900 or 1.5 for 5% of the data set, which contains both runway condition codes and PI reps, which is the relationship that we want to explore um, in further detail in this paper. So uh, we'll be looking at some um, uh, analysis and results from both of these um, subsets in the following slides. But first, uh, we wanted to look at the overall geographic distribution. Um, and uh, as, as can be anticipated, uh, there, is, there is a higher concentration of the PyCon reports um, from wet and cold areas with drier and warmer areas tending to have higher PyCon values. Uh, and the ideal field conditions are not reported in the data set. A total of around uh, 1,950 uh, distinct airports across the US and the Caribbean uh, is uh, is the totality of the data set that we are working with. So um, while it's, it's a large uh, sample size, it's, it's still restricted to um, the, the, uh, an analysis purely based on data from the US um, and the Caribbean. Um, and then if you look at um, on, the, on the bottom right here, the seasonal variation. Uh, so we have data like collected across five years <clears throat> with um, more consistent collection uh, in more recent years compared to um, the, the early years. And um, data collection that went up to, I think, October of um, 2020. Uh, so a majority of FICON reports, as, as we can see, are from the winter months um, for the US. So um, this is a, a, as anticipated and <clears throat> kind of corroborates the, the previous point that we were talking about. So in the next few slides, we'll dive deeper into these two subsets that I've talked about, starting, um, starting with, with the first one. But before I go into that, I just wanted to give a small note about the, the FICON reporting uh, related to the homogeneity in the runway condition codes. So uh, as I said, uh, the, the runway condition codes are typically um, reported in uh, thirds of the runway. So, um, in most cases, um, actually in around 98% of the data set that we are looking at, um, the, the PyCons report homogeneous conditions across the entire runway. So there isn't a significant difference between 
the first third of the runway and second or the third um, that a different runway condition code would be uh, attached to that um, separate third. Um, in a very small percentage um, highlighted at the top here, um, we have um, non-homogeneous reporting across all thirds. So, um, you know, one part of the runway might might be in a slightly better condition compared to the other um, in, in these very small uh, percentage of cases. During analysis, we when, when we desired a single value, we just defaulted to the worst of the three uh, non-homogeneous conditions. So a 553 five, would, would get um, recorded as a three in, in analysis where we wanted to only work with one single um, condition code. For most cases though, um, it, it, it's um, homogeneous. And so um, we, we can sort of uh, keep that in mind when we go through the analysis. They just uh, 10 minutes left in there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll accelerate a little bit in the interest of time. Uh, so looking at the first uh, subset of the runway uh, condition codes, this is the one where we have uh, the runway descriptor categories. Um, we had three possible categories, but we only focused on one because we had reliable data for, the, uh, for, for that category. So the runway treatment uh, refers to modifications that are made to the surface to reduce standing water or hydroplaning potential. Um, three types of treatment were observed in our data set. Um, groove GRVD stands for grooved runways, PFC is for porous friction, and non is uh, no treatment observed. So there's a, uh, and then uh, from progressively from green to red um, is um, progressively worse runway condition codes as can be seen from the key here. Um, and what we observed is there is a significant trend correlation as expected between uh, non-treated and treated runways with the grooved and PFC runways um, uh, showing much better performance than uh, uh, the runways that were not treated in terms of the condition codes that have been assigned to these um, runways. So this is uh, th this was something that was uh, anticipated based on physics-based relations um, is also sort of substantiated through this data-driven treatment. Um, the next uh, subset that we were interested in, which is really the, the, the one where we had um, the smallest amount of data around 9,000, but this is the one where we, we wanted to extract the most uh, meaningful relationships from. Um, and um, this was the subset with runway condition codes and pilot reports. So the condition codes, um, the, the sum of the uh, available runway condition code breaking action and the static variables at the airport, such as the runway uh, slopes and uh, other things um, are, are what the uh, crew uses for um, their uh, time of arrival um, landing assessments. And so um, what is expected is that the sum of these two uh, should reasonably be reflected in the pilot reported breaking action reports. And this is what we'll be looking at uh, to see whether there's a, a, a good correlation between the two or if there's a lot of discrepancy. So the figure on the right here now shows uh, the runway condition codes on the x-axis with the pilot reported breaking action uh, color coded from green to, to red uh, to indicate um, uh, good breaking action to worse breaking action. As we can see, going from lower runway condition codes to higher condition codes, um, the, the proportion of good breaking reports um, steadily increases and the proportion of uh, the, the, the really poor breaking reports diminishes significantly. However, um, it should be noted that there are some observations that we made here, which is um, that you know, even for the worst runway condition code of 111, um, around 25% of the pilot reported breaking action was still medium or better. So this can, this can lead to um, uh, 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 conjecture that the, either the condition codes might be overly conservative or uh, the PIREPs are highly optimistic. And you know, whether or not this is true can be uh, further examined or understood based on um, different variables, uh, specifically the contaminant and non-contaminant variables. So we'll be looking at uh, a couple of those in the next two slides. So um, 
this is the relationship of uh, the pilot reported breaking action again uh, with the different contaminant variables. Um, now, while it's hard to generalize the trends that are observed here um, on this chart, um, generally what, what it highlights is the differences between the different contaminant types, um, such as you know, ice, which would have um, the worst uh, distribution of the reported breaking action from pilots compared to snow, compared to wet runways. Um, a difference is also observed in terms of um, the, the depth of the contaminant itself um, being from uh, one fourth of an inch to one eighth of an inch to um, other depths. So uh, 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 an increase in depth results in uh, increase in severity, which might be one of the reasons uh, we were looking at the discrepancy on observed on the previous slide. When we look at the relationship with non-contaminant variables, it, it is more um, along lines that are expected. So uh, when you're landing on a positive or an uphill slope, that tends to have a, a, a good relationship with or a strong positive relationship with good reported breaking action. So even if the runway condition code is slightly worse, but you're landing on an up, uh, uphill airport or an uphill runway, that would um, lead to pilots reporting good breaking action. And then the runway treatment, which, which we, we saw the same chart earlier for the entire data set, um, follows a similar, um, uh, similar trend among the, the subset that has um, pilot reported breaking action. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the relationships that we observe from the contaminant and non-contaminant variables help us uh, put into context some of the discrepancies or some of the um, observations that we were making from the earlier um, part. So um, we also did a, a small multivariate analysis based on those three um, variables that I talked about, runway treatment, slope, and condition code, um, because we've seen that each of them individually affects the, um, the breaking action reports. We wanted to see if there were any interaction effects, especially between the runway condition code and the slope, as I was alluding to earlier. Um, and what we did was uh, two-way and three-way ANOVA tests. Um, and as, as we had um, expected or anticipated from the TALPA uh, recommendations, um, we found that there is, there is an interaction effect um, uh, that is of statistical significance between the runway condition codes and the slope. So what that means is um, for, for very high positive slopes, um, you, know, you could have um, better looking uh, pilot reported breaking actions, uh, even when the runway condition codes are um, relatively worse. And the same thing for the other extreme where for downhill slopes, even if the runway condition codes are, are slightly better, you would, you would see uh, more negative pilot reported breaking actions. Uh, and so these uh, sort of substantiate some of those interactions that are expected um, from um, from the, the variables, both contaminant and non-contaminant variables that we're looking at uh, for this research. So some overall observations from, um, from the work that we've conducted. Um, we, we were able to um, uh, conclude that you know, the existing data sets are manageable and accessible for use in a longer time frame analysis. Um, we had to do some data cleaning processes for obvious errors and outliers, but that doesn't necessarily negate the statistical importance um, of the analysis. And then uh, most importantly, the general trends and correlations that we got from the data analysis are consistent with anecdotal experience or prior physics-based models, uh, which, which really gives some substantiation to uh, the recommendations that have been made in the past. Um, so um, I'll quickly um, present some concluding remarks and next steps that we have from this uh, work. Um, this is work in progress, ongoing uh, project that, uh, that is um, expected to, to include more elements uh, going into the future. But to start off, we, what we wanted to do here was to demonstrate the, a process for you know, using all these relevant data sources for a quantitative um, breaking assessment study. Uh, we wanted to look at the relationship between uh, these different um, contaminant, non-contaminant, static, and uh, dynamic variables um, over a large period of time. And we, we also ended up um, providing some data-driven substantiation of the trends that are expected based on those TALPA recommendations. 
um, we have a couple of next steps. Uh, the first one being to use this um, uh, fuse data in a supervised machine learning study um, that, that we are cu currently uh, formulating. And then ideally we would want to expand this beyond just the US FICONs, although there would be some uh, standardization required. And then the final step is gonna be to try and include flight data records in this analysis as well. So with that, uh, I would just like to acknowledge our um, sponsors from the FAA Tech Center and I reiterate that you know, the views expressed in, a, in, in the presentation are those of the, the team at Georgia Tech and do not constitute any flight standards or certification policy for the FAA. I will now conclude my presentation and be open for any questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, Tejas, uh, great presentation. Uh, we have kind of run out of time, but there might be one, time for one question. Uh, Xavier Olive asks um, about intended future work with QAR data with respect to analysis of landing phase. Can you share insights about the detection of the touchdown point, uh, which has been in my experience quite hard to pinpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually um, uh, the, the second future work that I talked about, which is you know, related to the flight data records, um, we are trying to uh, utilize QAR data um, in, in conjunction with the FICON data. And one of the challenges is sort of having a, a, a you know, fused data set that covers the same time frame. Um, with respect to the uh, identification of the touchdown point, um, we luckily the, the data sets that we are dealing with right now contain um, you know, certain parameters like you know, the weight on wheels or things like that which are able to um, provide uh, an approximation of where the aircraft touches down on the runway. Uh, but if, if that is not available, then um, you know, in the past, we've done some work um, using um, altitude rates and, um, and other um, parameters recorded in QAR that we can use to estimate the approximate touchdown point. So that's one of the challenges, but in this uh, project, we won't uh, face that because we have approximations available to us. Excellent. Um, we unfortunately have run out of time, so I will hold my questions and bother you later. Thank you very much. Great presentation. And Thank you. Uh, we'll give a virtual applause here. Thank so you. we will uh, move on to the uh, next presenter. Uh, Alberto Bonifazzi uh, obtained a master's degree in aerospace engineering from Delft uh, University of Technology in 2020. There, he developed an interest in air traffic management and data analytics, and this paper represents the outcome of his master's thesis. Currently, he is working as a solution engineer in SES, a satellite operator. Alberto, I will give you a 10-minute warning and a two-minute warning, so please take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay. I hope you can see the slides and you can also hear me. Um, thank you very much for being here attending this presentation about uh, modeling and detecting anomalous safety events in approach flights using ADSB data. I worked uh, on this paper together with Yunzi, Gerban and Yako, who were my supervisors, supervisors during the master thesis. We decided to focus on the approach phase because between 2011 and 2015, 65% of all commercial flights occurred in the approach and landing phase. In the continuation of this video, you can see an example of a go-around. This is one of the events that we detected in this thesis. The aircraft aborts landing, starts climbing, retracts its landing gear, and uh, slowly will start turning. A go-around is not an anomalous safety event. However, the, cause are, the causes of a go-around can potentially lead to an anomalous safety event. That's why we analyzed it and we try to look for the causes of it. Now it's turning and it will continue until it aligns again with the landing runway. In this video, instead, you can see an example of an unstable approach. I hope you can hear the audio. This is the ground proximity warning system alerting for an excessive sink rate. An unstable approach is characterized by an anomalous flight path or speed.
Let me give you some more details on the case study used for, for this paper. So all the research revolves around the, the approaches at Schiphol Airport. This is one of the, this is the first airport in Europe by aircraft movements. And uh, we analyzed this airport also because the research is performed together with ILT, a part of the Ministry of the Infrastructure of the Netherlands, that is particularly interested in gaining insights on the safety of operations at Schiphol. Furthermore, given the location of the university and the, the, the receiver setup that uh, you can see in the figure, we are able to get uh, ADSB data in this phase. And so we were able to analyze it. So we had data available. The research question and objective for uh, the paper and the thesis were, how can ADSB data be used to gain insights into the safety performance of Schiphol Airport? and to propose ILT, a set of safety indicators that provide insights into the safety performance of aircraft operations around Schiphol Airport by mining ADSB data. Let me give you an overview of uh, how the research uh, was performed and how I'm gonna explain it. So first, I will discuss about the data and the pre-processing techniques. Then um, the description of the unstable approach uh, model and go around model the results and finally the conclusion the most important piece of data used in this research is ADSB data which provides information about the position the speed the track angle and the count number of the uh, of the aircraft this information then is augmented thanks to the aircraft database provided by open sky and uh, also Schiphol inf aeronautical information services are used and in, per in particular the instrument approach chart to, give, to have a uh, um, clear understanding of how operations are performed at the airport. Furthermore, also weather data is used, the meta report, the meteorological aerodrome report that provides precise information about uh, the weather at the airport, pressure, temperature, and, and so on and the global forecast system data from NOAA. This is very useful because it provides wind information at higher altitudes. Let's move on to the pre-processing. So we remove uh, helicopters, general, general aviation aircrafts, and military aircrafts that are, that, um, uh, because we focused our attention on commercial uh, aviation aircraft. We identify the flight phase and the landing runway for each uh, trajectory. We fix the track angle uh, provided by the ADSP. We compute the altitude above ground and the true airspeed because uh, the original information provided by the ADSP data is ground speed and pressure altitude. And finally, we assess the severity of the weather situation using uh, um, the ATMAP uh, algorithm from uh, Eurocontrol. Let's move on on the description of uh, the models. And uh, for the unstable approach, we use two models, horizontal compliance, and uh, we define two models. The horizontal compliance we, we, that we call horizontal compliance and energy compliance. In general, unstable approaches must always be followed by go arounds. However, it's estimated that uh, even if 3% of approaches are unstable, they are followed by go around only 3% of the time. The resultant compliance model um, uses two principles, let's say uh, it's based on two principles from the Flight Safety Foundation that are that ILS approaches must be flown within one degree of the localizer and that an aircraft must be stabilized at 1000 feet in instrument meteorological condition and 500 feet in visual meteorological condition. You can see the implementation of these two norms on the picture on the right. The gray area is the horizontal compliance area. The dark blue, we have, in dark blue we have the runway and then in blue and green, we have the gates respectively at 1,000 feet and 500 feet. And the, an anomalous flight is detected when uh, 
it doesn't intercept the gate at 1,000 feet when flying in instrument meteorological condition, and it doesn't intercept the gate at 500 feet when flying in visual meteorological condition. Let, let me discuss now the energy compliance method. The assumption here is that the unstable approach, approaches are linked with poor energy management, and this is a, a common uh, assumption in, uh, in literature. And uh, anomaly detection here is performed using a Gauss mixture model, mixture model, of which you can see an animated figure on the right. This strategy is composed of two steps. First, creating the energy features, and then the anomaly detection. Here you can see an overview of the energy features and how they vary based on the distance to the runway threshold. We have uh, the specific potential energy, the specific kinetic energy, and the specific total energy and the rates, the energy angle, and the time to run with threshold. For the anomaly detection step, we use a, a, Gaussian mixture, a Gaussian mixture model. In particular, we train three different Gaussian mixture models to avoid the, that the Gaussian mixture model learns two general behavior. The first one trained between 0 0.5 and 4 nautical miles. This is the area uh, that presents the gray gates at 500 to 1,000 feet, so where the aircraft is stable. Then between 4 and 7, here the second GMM learns how the aircraft intercepts the ILS. And finally, between 7 and 10, the aircraft performs uh, uh, various maneuvers from turning uh, to uh, descending to flight level. The output of the GMM is shown in the picture you can see on the slide, with a focus on the third GMM, the one trained between 7 and 10 nautical miles. You can see the two components of this GMM, and the, the plot is uh, uh, on a specific total energy uh, distance to runway threshold uh, axis. <laughs> Anomaly detection is performed uh, based on a threshold that allows so, uh, to find anomalous points. And later, anomalous flights are identified if at least two anomalous points are present in the last seven nautical miles. The detection uh, of uh, go around uh, instead uses a uh, soon phase detector as a first step. This is used to detect rapid changes in aircraft behavior, in particular when the aircraft aborts landing and starts climbing again. The causes of, possible causes of a go around are unstable approaches, conflicting traffic, or adverse weather conditions. And um, when, um, after detecting the change in phase, what we do is uh, uh, we use S function to model the behavior of a go around and to obtain a similarity score. The feature for IDSB data that are used are rate of climb, altitude, ground speed, and track angle. It might not be very clear how the model works, so I'll, uh, I'll guide you through an example. On the left, you can see a detected go around, and on the right, you can see the scores obtained by the forest functions for each ADSB feature. Furthermore, you can also see the different phases detected by Sun's phase detector. The red line in between is the threshold line. So if we have uh, points above this line, the algorithm will uh, label the trajectory as a go around. At T0, the aircraft is uh, the, the aircraft, uh, the, the change, uh, there is the phase change. So from uh, uh, descending, uh, the aircraft starts climbing, detected using Sun's phase detector. After two minutes, we see that uh, the altitude, the rate of climb, and the ground speed score above, above the threshold. It takes longer for the track angle to, to increase. But after 10 minutes, once the aircraft is once more aligned with the run landing runway, it scores its maximum, it scores its, its maximum, its maximum value. 
overall, the data used uh, um, comes from uh, uh, the year 2018, from all the 12 months. And uh, there is, the results uh, that uh, I'm going to present are, are articulated as, as follows. First, some examples of detected events. Then the validation. And finally, a small demo that shows how the results can be used to monitor, to monitor uh, some safety indicators. Here you can see an example of uh, a detected event of an horizontal, of uh, an unstable approach detected using the horizontal compliance uh, algorithm. You can see that the aircraft intercept uh, the gate at 500 feet. <laughs> and in this figure, instead, uh, we can see, uh, let's say, the, the dashboard for an unstable approach. I say the dashboard because uh, uh, first, this, uh, this trajectory has been labeled, labeled unstable by the GMM. And then uh, I've plot uh, uh, the, the various points to, to gain a better understanding of why this trajectory was labeled as, uh, as unstable. We see from the specific potential energy and the specific kinetic energy that the aircraft has an higher le energy level, and from the rates that the aircraft is actively trying to decelerate. Indeed, from the distance to runway threshold, we can see that this aircraft is uh, advancing faster than normal. The plot on the bottom right. This slide shows uh, um, go, the go rounds detected on the 8th of January uh, 2018. We can see that three go rounds were detected. Now let's move to the validation. The horizontal compliance um, detected only two unstable approaches over the full year of 2018, one of which is a false positive. Thus, we can conclude that uh, aircraft are most times within the horizontal stability limits. For the energy compliance instead, we validated the model using uh, a validation list provided by ILT uh, with known unstable approaches. The list comprised of 48 unstable approaches. However, only 31 trajectories were present in the ADSB data. Detection accuracy is the duration between the detected and stable approaches present in the list over the overall number of uh, uh, unstable approaches in the list. And the ratio of positives is the ratio between uh, unstable approaches detected over the total number of uh, approaches detected. The total number of unstable approaches detected over the total number of approaches. We can see that as we increase the threshold for detecting anomalous points, the detection accuracy increases, reaching 90%. However, also the ratio of positive increases, reaching 40%. It's likely that among these 40%, many of these flights uh, are false positives. For this reason, we choose the threshold to be 0 0.1, that allows for a 26% detection accuracy and overall 3,000 flights labeled as unstable approaches in the year 2018. Now the validation of the go around. Um, in the plot on the left, uh, we can see a validation performed with another data set provided by, the, by ILT consisting of uh, 65 go arounds. The not present column refers to the go arounds that were not present in the ADSB data. And if we compare the detected and the undetected, we can see that the majority of the, the vast majority of garants are detected, bringing the accuracy of this model to 98%. On the right, instead, we can see uh, a second validation performed manually inspecting each uh, go around detected in 2018. There were 300 uh, go arounds. And also in this case, we can see that uh, uh, the full, the, the vast majority are actually go around since the false positives are very low, around 
let's now uh, let me now show you the demo of the of the monitoring dashboard in this plot we can see the amount of unstable approaches per month furthermore we can also see the amount of unstable approach concurrent to different weather situation you can see three different colors and it's also possible to filter this plot by runway so to sh to so to see the overview only for a particular runway we can see that the amount of stable appro unstable approaches is between 200 and 300 for each month. The maximum values are reached in January, March, and July, and the minimum in February. We can also see that the weather, severe weather in purple, is concurrent to unstable approaches by 25% in January and December. This is the highest amount and the minimum amount occurs in June and July. We can also filter it by runway. We can see that runway 36R is the runway in which the majority of unstable approaches happen, while runway 27 is the runway that seems to be most impact by weather condition. In fact, we see that around 40% of unstable approaches happen in severe weather condition overall, with peaks in January and December of around 60% and 50% respectively. Let's jump on the overview of uh, go around. So here instead, there are three different tabs. The first tabs, the first tab, shows an overview of go rounds detected in 2018. We can see that the highest amount occurs in January. Also in this case, it's possible to filter uh, the overview by runway. If we click uh, on the second tab, the precursor tab, here we try to understand the causes of go rounds. In the first plot, we can see the relationship between go around and unstable approaches. This uh, highlights the aircraft that before performing a go around were considered unstable by the Gaussian mixture model, model algorithm. We can see that April and October are the months in which 40% of go arounds are pre preceded by an, an unstable approach. The second plot shows the relationship between a go around and conflicting traffic. We can see how the separation to the closest aircraft that performs the go around varies in different months. Because the minimum distance is above 1.5 nautical miles, we can conclude that the conflicting traffic doesn't influence much go arounds. And finally, the weather condition. In this plot, we can see how the um, amount of go arounds is impacted by the weather situation. We can see peaks. This is similar to what was shown in the unstable approach chart. We can see that the peaks are in January and December, with around 60% of go arounds happening concurrently to, unstable approach, uh, to severe weather conditions. Finally, there is the last tab, cross analysis. Here, these different features can be combined to obtain further insights into operations in into approaches at Schiphol Airport. Let's filter it by runway. Runway TNR is the runway that shows the, the highest amount of go rounds. On runway 27, we can see once more that is the runway that is most impact but severe weather situation. Overall, 
the amount is around uh, um, 55 percent with a peak in january of 90 percent the runway that is most impacted by unstable approaches in, is runway 06 and in particular the month of april we can see that uh, overall there are six square rounds happening in april of which five preceded by an unstable an, an unstable approach so let's now move on the recommendations uh, one of the limitations encountered in this uh, study was the availability of ADSB data. As it, it was mentioned during the validation, 20, uh, it, it happened uh, that go rounds and unstable approaches present, trajectories present in the validation list was then not present in the ADSB data. And uh, uh, another uh, uh, um, limitation related to ADSB, ADSB data availability concerns the frequency, frequency of ADSB data at low altitude compared to the ones at high, at high altitude. In particular, the frequency at low altitude was lower and this impacts more the detection of uh, unstable approaches. Furthermore, um, another limitation was uh, the absence of a proper validation data set. For future work, more anomalous safety events can be, um, can be identified, some of which with small modification of, the, of some of these models. For example, by modifying the go-around uh, model, it, can be, it could be possible to, identifying, to identify all the impact patterns, which, provide, uh, which can, provide, uh, can be used to provide a measure of uh, ATC workload. Furthermore, uh, the, the scope of the, of the monitoring uh, dashboard can be enlarged to other flat phases, such as takeoff and ground operations. And uh, in this respect, it will be uh, extremely important to get uh, better ADSB data at uh, low altitude. Finally, um, predicting go rounds and unstable approaches would be the uh, natural next step of the research. To summarize, this paper develops uh, a new data-driven strategy to monitor unstable approaches and go-arounds using aviation and meteorological open data. The detection accuracy is 26% for unstable approaches and 98% 98 of go-arounds. And we show that with the monitoring dashboard, it's possible to gain uh, in, uh, and we showed that uh, with the monitor, monitoring dashboard that uses the results of this algorithm, it's possible to gain insights into, this, uh, into operations at Schiphol Airport. In particular, as it was mentioned, runway 27 seems to be uh, the runways, runway most impact by severe weather condition. Thank you for your attention. Alberto, a great presentation. Um, and uh, thank you for leaving uh, some amount of time for questions. Uh, Wes Olson asked in the uh, Q&A panel here, I will read it out for you for validation. Does the ANSB record go arounds and the associated reason? In some cases, a go around is triggered by surface traffic, which are not included in your data set. Uh, validating against an ASP generated list of go arounds and associated context would be useful. Uh, comments? Um, would be nice to be able to read this question. I'm not sure if I, I will just stop uh, presenting. If uh, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. just okay, open okay. the queue. I, I figured out. I figured out. Yes, yes. I found it. I found it. Okay. Um, so um, the data set that was provided was uh, about. Uh, uh, Go arounds, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, go arounds and uh, a description of uh, the go around. And in some cases, go around is triggered by surface traffic, which are not included in your data set. Uh, you mean the surface traffic is doing, ah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, well, that's conflicting traffic, like uh, we, we could, uh, 
we could call it conflicting conflicting traffic i guess uh, maybe i'm not uh, what is your issue? um i i uh, uh i assume this question is uh, those would have to be considered different from uh, pilot induced errors uh, uh, so yeah. uh, did you oh, have yeah. a way uh, to get the context and separate yeah, that out uh, well we try to get uh, uh, let's say an idea of this in the last uh, like we had the poor data availability at low altitudes like not super poor but uh, was not uh, was not great so definitely like uh, it could be considered better but we try to try to get an idea of uh, how conflicting traffic influences the presence of a go around. In fact, I don't know if you remember the monitoring dashboard. At some point, there was one of the feature was a uh, distance to closest aircraft, and based on that, we try to get an understanding of that. But uh, yeah, of course, it can be improved. Uh, for the attendees, if you have questions, please do submit them. While they're thinking about questions, um, you indicated that uh, absence of a proper validation data set mm -hmm. uh, has been a hindrance. Uh, mm -hmm. What would your uh, thoughts be on creating a validation set? Or, or ideally, what would you like to see as a validation set? Yeah, it would be nice to, to, to be able to test the algorithms in a, a more direct, uh, direct way. And so it would be nice to have, uh, um, uh, of course, it takes a lot of time, but it would be nice to have a, a kind of a fake data set uh, on which you kind of know a lot of parameters and you know uh, if, if it's an unstable approach or not. And based on this data set, uh, uh, being able to, let's say, uh, refine uh, algorithms to, to detect those cases. Um, so uh, have you... Uh, is there an effort to get FOQA or FMS data for a particular uh, range so, of days so that, or something like this? So that would be that would be great. So, if, for instance, in this case, we didn't have uh, access to this uh, to this type of data, and, uh, and so that, that's also why the focus of the research was to use only open data. In fact, uh, let's right. say that, yeah. Um, but yeah, like uh, that would be would be would be a, a good improvement. I see another question popping up, which is the criteria for a stable approach. Do you consider spooling up the engines in short final? Um, so the criteria for detecting, uh, th this was not, uh, I, I don't have uh, like the, um, the data set used to detect unstable approach is uh, consists of uh, ADSB data and the features then were maybe were, were a bit refined uh, based on the weather information, but let's say it's mainly at this big data. So I didn't I didn't have this information about uh, spooling up uh, the engines, and both uh, the criteria for detecting unstable approach are basically the energy features shown. Maybe I can show. You. Uh, can you see see the slides? Uh, yes, we can see the slides. You can go back to your slide. Yeah. So so um, there is this set of energy features. And um, then the uh, Gaussian mixture model is trained based on this feature to detect uh, uh, unstable approaches. But yeah, like not uh, directly speed and altitude, but uh, let's say uh, potential energy and uh, kinetic energy. Uh, what would it take, uh, uh, Gonzalo says, nice work. Uh, what would it take to extend the same analysis to other airports? Uh, is this highly specific to ski pole? Uh, if you had to do the analysis for uh, multiple airports, what would you do? Well, first of all, uh, availability of ADSB data, because uh, <laughs> the, the, okay. yeah, I assume the... ADSB data is available. If ADSB data is available, uh, is it easily replicable across uh, airports and countries? Yeah, so, so the idea, the idea, exactly, the idea was to have kind of a, um, um, a methodology that is uh, efficient and cost effective to monitor traffic. So this, this was also one of the underlying, uh, one of the reason pushing this uh, research forward. And um, it, it is, uh, uh, some models are more uh, replicable than others. So the uh, unstable approach, it's, all, it's purely based on uh, 
on the energy features so it's it's really plug and play go around uh, the direction of go around unless there are any specific uh, let's, let's say uh, measures operational measures at the airport should also be plug and play because the detection of yeah. go arounds uh, works on uh, uh, modeling uh, um, how a go around should behave using this function and it was very clear based on by studying a bit the instrument approach chart how uh, let's say how um, approach and landing are performed at people so then it was uh, it was possible to uh, define uh, s functions for modeling a go around so unless uh, but unless there are no specific uh, let's say what taking into account uh, special provision posts that are possible at the airport then also the go around model it, it's possible to use also the go around model the model that that is least applicable is um, is uh, the the first uh, methodology to detect uh, unstable approaches because that one is uh, really based on uh, uh, geometry so it really uses uh, the specific geometry of the runway and the specific interception points uh, and so on to identify unstable approaches so that one would need uh, let's say the highest degree of adaptation uh, among the three models um uh, there are no more open questions i have one more question i think we have uh, time sir um in general for these kind of uh, studies it would be nice to understand the computational requirements uh when we're comparing algorithms uh obviously accuracy uh, is important but uh, if multiple approaches are being adopted it would be nice to know the computational requirements so that we can operationalize this can you speak a little bit about that yeah um the yeah uh, unfortunately i don't have numbers about uh, about this in particular but um the the gaussian mixture uh, model approach uh, for uh, and the let's say the energy compliance model is the one that is uh, that requires the highest amount of uh, comp computational resources um while the other two are uh, um, quite uh, like they, they are quite fast um okay if you remember from the demo then once let's say go around are identified then we also try to look at possible precursors of these go arounds by let's say re uh, um, identifying possibly unstable approaches before or if there was conflicting traffic uh, and uh, and so on so we try to identify possible causes of go arounds and um, uh, let's say uh, looking at this whole process that uh, that one took uh, quite a bit of time um computationally wise unfortunately i don't have numbers about it uh, that's so okay that's okay yeah just a thought for future work uh there's an anonymous attendee question here uh who appreciates the presentation but also asks how could airport operators examples keep all use or apply your results to improve local safety in daily operations well, this is um, is not really to the, the idea is not really to identify uh, maybe an operational problem in Schiphol. It's more to monitor it. So it's more to realize that uh, maybe there are, are too many unstable approaches and too many go arounds. So it, in reality, it's more useful to um, to someone that is looking, uh, let's say, from an higher perspective compared to the operator as people. So more someone that as is overseeing the safety at the, at the airport and it allows, it says, okay, the airport, I can consider the airport safe because I have this criteria and based on this criteria, the airport is performing well. So in, in fact, okay. uh, this, the, the point of view of this research, uh, this research comes from uh, a request of the Ministry of the Infrastructure of the Netherlands and not from uh, skip okay. um, uh, th thanks for answering that. Did you take a look at, uh, it could also be uh, operator training, right? Uh, airline operator training related issues. It could be the airport is unsafe. It could also be that uh, training is, so uh, try to identify between different airline operators or? Um, 
so, so uh, you, you mean like uh, identify based on the operator, airline mm -hmm. operator, which one performs the highest amount? Yeah, that's uh, right. we didn't want to do that, but that's uh, that's possible. Okay, um, you answered a lot of uh, questions, Alberto. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Great presentation. I think uh, we are now probably ready for coffee. Uh, for folks, just a reminder, other room links are in the uh, chat window. And Claudio, I, will, I think I will turn this back over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claudio. Wonderful uh, orchestration of the whole thing.